this works. Uh, still says upcoming. I may have to change the key out again. Nope. Looks like we're live. It's very exciting. All right. Let's pretend we're live. I, I think we're live. I love how, <laughs> you know, doing stand up live means you walked from backstage through the curtain and you're on stage now. Like you can tell. Right. Like there's a, a definitive difference. And then it's pretty obvious. And then when you're yeah. talking to somebody over the internet, you're talking to them. And then you go, well, now other people can hear us. Feels yeah. exactly the same. <laughs> Feels the same. There's no change. <laughs> Yeah, except, um, you know, maybe we'll be able to see this views number uh, change if people... Christ, don't, uh, don't, don't tell me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I think I'm supposed to be able to get uh, chats. I'm going I'm to feel upset either way. If it's 13 people, that's not enough. <laughs> if it's 13,000, that's too many. I, I can't be appeased. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, welcome, Ryan Stout, to this, uh, uh, I guess I'm calling we're, we're it for now. We're welcoming now. Now, um, now we're going to do a welcome. Yeah, we're, we're going to talk that. to you for an hour. <laughs> formal. <laughs> Super formal now, now yeah. that we're live. Okay, great. It's very obvious. Um, <laughs> uh, so, but, I mean, if there's people watching this that have been watching my my channel, yeah. and they they should know about you, because I mentioned you on a lot of the videos, uh, you're, you helped me write the knee of the curve uh series right we've known each other for uh de is it decades probably it two decades i mean i probably yeah. met you in either 2001 or 2002 so we're, we're almost at a two decade mark when did you start doing stand up yeah. you can't find it no, I oh it says it's private uh -oh. dang it And and now we're live. <laughs> We've been live so many times, and you know what? It's it's exciting every time. It's equally as exciting every time. This one, this one's for real. Well, this is for all the marbles. I'm here. so glad. Uh, I think maybe they can see the times where we weren't live. Maybe they can eventually, when it posts, go and and see how many times we were live. Listen, I don't mind because I've been brilliant the whole time. You have. Yeah, You've so, been nailing it. Okay. I, if they can't find it, if they can't see those, man, it's really Strap lost. in. It's going to so. be more of the same. <laughs> so, yes, we, we've um, known each other for almost two decades. Uh, you, yeah. When did you start doing stand-up? I started in 2000. Okay. Um, yeah, started in 2000 out of my parents' house. Uh and were you in college I was doing it in Sacramento? Actually, you know what? I, I graduated college and I went to I moved to L.A. And uh, I got some great advice from Dane Cook. OK, he said, get the hell out of my city. OK, um, there's only room for one of me here. Sure. No, but his advice was really like um, if you're starting in L.A., it's not a great place to start because the industry is here Awful. and you suck when you first start. Awful place so, to start. Yeah. Well, that's why so I moved get out to of San city. Francisco. I moved to San Francisco because I didn't want to start in New York or L.A. I had I had that kind of foresight right. as an 18 year old. <laughs> yeah, that's where he told me to go. He goes, where are you from? I'm like, Sacramento. He's like, go to Sacramento. Do it there. Get good enough to go to San Francisco. Do it there. When you're good enough, come back to L.A. Yeah. And so I had been in L.A. only about maybe six months and I was my lease was coming up and I said, OK. Done. So you graduated college, moved to LA, and then started like getting on stage down here. I did. Oh my god! Yeah, I got up on stage at uh, at some really hole in the wall places, little little gay bars. Uh huh. Um, they loved me. Sure. Uh, that's where or, I learned. The or at least twink. you were good looking Apparently enough that I they was a twink. they pretended to like you. Right. Yeah. I mean, I I definitely wasn't funny. Um, but, uh, <laughs> uh, that's, that's fascinating anyway. that, that you would, uh, I, I moved to LA after I'd been doing it for five years. I already had a manager. I'd already won a national comedy competition and I moved to LA How and, did you... and everybody went, who the hell are you? 
And I said, it doesn't matter. Yeah. Can I just, uh, can I get on the stage, please? And then I would get on the stage and they'd be like, oh, you have material. Oh, we weren't expecting that. Because yeah. we, <laughs> we expect that every new face is garbage. <laughs> and so yeah. it's really easy to make a splash in LA if you just show up and do your best seven minutes at every hole in the wall out there for like months right. on end. And then <laughs> after everybody can just repeat your jokes word for word, you just change and do a whole new seven minutes and they go, oh, he's brilliant. Oh my God, he's right. got all this material. <laughs> all uh, this material, yeah. he's got what? 14 minutes, 14 that's, minutes. That's a lot in LA. He just turned it over. Yeah. <laughs> it was Killer 7 and then a new Killer 7. Uh, give him a TV Oof. series. <laughs> Which is hilarious because the priority when you're starting outside of LA is, well, you need to develop, to develop 45 minutes to an hour so that you can be right, a headliner. Right, you want a headline yeah, and nobody, make money. Nobody in LA right, gives a shit if you're a headliner. Touring. Yeah, nobody in LA that's a comic really wants to leave LA to go make money on the road. No. You have to be a real comic to do that. I, you know, most people here just want to get, just want to get that sitcom role, but does anybody even want to do that anymore? That seems like such a old, like at least five, 10 year old thing, maybe longer than that. Yeah. Doesn't, the doesn't idea of going like everybody to wants to Montreal be a YouTuber now. Right. <laughs> the idea that you would go to just for laughs in Montreal and get a, a holding deal or a development deal yeah. and they would just give you hundreds of thousands of dollars. Like that's what everybody was shooting for. And when all those deals went away, it turned out a lot of people who thought they wanted to do stand up didn't want to do stand up anymore. It was right. never about yeah. like developing something. It was about give me the money. Yeah. Yeah. Well, being a stand up comic is is a rough time uh, starting out. It's not for the faint of heart. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, it there's the good gigs that you can get the good tr with the good travel and the good hotel room and the and the good rooms with the good crowds and the good food. And then there's everything else that everyone has to do to, to finally get to those. Right. And it's just years and years and years of grinding and horrible hotel rooms and driving and bad crowds. Well, and, and what people food. outside of stand-up don't ever really recognize is that um, even if you are funny enough, that's when you're, when you're an outsider to stand-up, you think, well, if you're funny, you get the gigs. If you're not funny, you don't get the gigs. But what they don't realize is if there are 50 funny people only one of them can get the gig. <laughs> so there's yeah. a lot of competition amongst really funny people, and you can lose that competition in very simple ways. Either you're too dirty, or they think you might be too dirty, or you're just not the right look. I mean, I wear a suit and tie on stage, and so there were a lot of uh, opportunities out there where they're like, yeah, we just don't like what you look like. There were probably others where they're like, ah, oh, we yeah. love what you look like. But, you know, yeah. simple very surface level decisions being made beyond funny. So this is what I wanted to talk to you about also. So the suit, um, and cause we know each other from, from when we both first started way back and, uh, you were not wearing the suit and we were both just starting out. I think I'm a little bit older than you. I think you were still in college, um, uh, maybe your senior year or something. So I dropped out of college after my freshman year and moved to the Bay area and started doing stand up. And then after about six uh, months, went back to college and kept doing stand up. Okay. So what was nice was I went to San Francisco state university, uh, on my return to college. And the reason I went there was because I could move into the dorms, live in the city. And I think you only needed like a 2.0 to like <laughs> stay at the school. And I was like, great, I can do stand up every night and maintain a 2.0. That is a very low bar. <laughs> and uh, sure enough, I did. I went out every single yeah. night and then I would get home and it would be like one, two in the morning. And I'd be like, all right we could probably knock this homework out in about 30 minutes. And wow. Nice. And that's what happened. <laughs> Drunk after a set. Good for yeah, you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so, but you were not wearing the suit, me and you, we were very uh, similar. Mm -hmm. um, when we first met, we were both, uh, you know, tall, amazingly good looking white guys. Yeah. Um, trying to, 
say the edgiest things we possibly could uh, to get laughs. Mm-hmm. Um, and and uh, so wh- what was it about it? Because I, I mean, I don't want this to sound like so at first, when I remember uh, us meeting, I remember I was doing pretty good. And I remember um, I remember thinking to myself, oh, Ryan's not getting it. <laughs> like, uh, <laughs> and uh-huh. like, I remember seeing you have some rough sets yeah. and thinking, um, and thinking, you know, maybe to myself, you know, like in the hierarchy, I'm, I'm better than this guy, uh, funnier or whatever. Yeah, you were. And I remember, le- I remember leaving to go to LA and hearing this talk about Ryan Stout, Ryan Stout, and coming back and seeing you, and you had the suit on, and it was like you were doing the same material, yeah. and it was just crushing. Yeah, it was like your presentation changed. You learned something right. about how to cr- create <laughs> your, you know, like explain all that to me because that that moment must have been a, a watershed, eye opening, like amazing moment for you. Mm. Yeah, after. Um... After a few years of of grinding it out, I I think from an outsider's perspective, you never know what a comedian is actually doing on stage, especially a new comedian. And even though I wasn't having the greatest sets, in my head I was like, okay, I just did 15 jokes and 12 of them didn't work out great, but I'm going to remember the three that did and I'm going to set those aside. And then I would have more bad sets and, you know, for the most part, I might have three or four jokes that really did well, and then I'd set those aside. So by the time you went to LA and came back, I had just amassed a pile of jokes that really worked, and everybody had forgotten all the jokes that didn't work because those just got taken out of the equation. Uh, but the other element of it was presentation, you know, wearing the suit, slowing down a lot, looking the audience in the eye a lot more, really connecting a lot more, and then... Uh, yeah, things really yeah. started to mesh, especially around 2004. 2004, after I'd been doing it for three years, man, we were just banging on all cylinders. Not only the performance, but the writing. Because I wouldn't write a set-up yeah. punchline joke anymore. It was set-up punchline, tag, 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 uh, transition into a new joke, tag, tag, tag. Yeah. And the writing was just spilling out of me. Yeah, I don't think I've ever seen somebody... Uh, grow so fast and turn the corner from, uh, you know, just starting out and struggling to just crushing. Yeah. Uh, so fast. Uh, you know what it is? So it, I, I didn't want that to make that sound like, uh, you know, like it wasn't a compliment at first, but the compliment, you have to set it up to, I mean, everybody struggles at the beginning. Yeah. I didn't. I was, yeah. I was really funny right yeah. away. You got bad later. <laughs> Which was the fascinating? Yeah, later it just <laughs> well, it's just as fascinating to watch the the dive. It's almost <laughs> like um, if you if you watch somebody carrying like a boulder, like just a really big rock, and they're walking at some place and they put it down, and then you carry that. You watch them again, and you watch them again. And you go, "What is that idiot doing?" And then you look away a little yeah. bit, and then you turn around, and they've built this castle, and you go, "Oh, where did that come from?" <laughs> and it was like, "Well, it was being built the whole time." Uh, yeah. <laughs> and that's what I think most audiences really can't, I mean, they're really at a disadvantage. If you're a stand up comedy fan, you don't get to watch the thing being built. You get to see it when it's not built and then you get to see it when it is built <laughs> and you can't attend yeah. every show. You can't see the progress. You just, you see whatever results in front of your face at the time. Yeah. But the suit, and this is everybody always like, asks about the suit and yeah. the suit just came out of, I'm not a great dresser. I don't really care about fashion. I don't really keep up with fashion. And the suit was a good way to be like, oh, that's timeless. I'll just put that on and that'll be a nice uniform for me. And uh, it Mm -hmm. won't need to, I won't need to change it 10 years from now. Did did you ever have um, trouble with headliners going, oh, this guy's trying to, you know, upstage me? Um, No, a lot of headliners liked it because it, it provided a big contrast. Uh, Mm -hmm. and, and comics tend to like that. They don't, if, if you're wearing a cardigan and nice jeans because you were like, and it's converse on stage, you don't want some kid wearing that exact same outfit in front of you. (laughs) True. Yeah. Cause I mean, at first you were, you were emceeing when you were wearing the suit at first, right? Still. Um, so I emceed for a few years and then it was 2000, it was April of 2004. I started wearing the suit. 
So I've got plenty of tape okay. of uh, old sets, <clears throat> even even doing yeah, performances yeah. in New York at like the old Gotham Comedy Club before it moved, where yeah. I was in like jeans and a leather jacket <laughs> and yeah. longer hair. Um, there was a bowling shirt phase in there. You know, there were a lot of different outfits. <laughs> I wasn't I wasn't good with fashion and fashion oddly enough it's the first thing people notice about you when you take the stage. They immediately recognize all right who's this person I'm going to make judgments about them based on what I can see. Well what are they trying to tell me about who they are by what they have on? Yeah. Yeah. Um is a big thing. I always would think uh, every time I bought clothes, you know, am I going to wear this on stage? <laughs> yeah, a lot of comics, a lot of comics had that yeah. that purview, and uh, <laughs> I always thought it was a big waste of time. I thought it was a lot of mental energy that I didn't need to spend. Yeah, well, for me, I st I just started wearing the suit for uh, Nia the Curve, and and it it wasn't because I didn't want to think about fashion. It was because literally I'm trying to make the kind of show that I'm, you know, I'm emulating a last week tonight or, a, you know, any late night show yeah. um, that does comedy and news. So I figured, um, you know, wear the same uniform as, as those guys. Um, and also I do think that um, there's a, there's a gravitas and a mood set by a suit. Yeah. So uh, not only does like for you when you started wearing it you do a lot of edgy material i think um not just delivery uh, style and um and honing good jokes but like um the ability to tell certain types of jokes because of the mood of this suit it's like it almost it it lets people off the hook like oh nobody that's dressed that nice talks like this so sure. there's like an extra level of of joke uh, that comes along with that. Well, I wanted them to to think, hey, if he put this much effort into what he looks like, he probably put effort into the words that are coming out of his mouth. And what resulted were, yeah, the the result was I had people after the show who would say, you know what I liked about it? It was smart. And yet you'd mm -hmm. have the people who didn't like it who'd say, I didn't like it because it was offensive. And you go, wow, that's so strange because the people who liked it didn't find it offensive at all. And then the people yeah. who found it offensive <laughs> didn't find it smart at all. So those are not yeah, uh, mutually perfect, exclusive. You guys need to reevaluate right. how you're right. viewing the show. And um, I would I would argue from day one that I was never trying to be offensive. I was absolutely looking for that material that would um, you wouldn't feel good about, but mentally you go, ah, that's kind of true though. Exactly. Yeah. With all the stuff that I do as well, that walks the line, the edge is, uh, yeah, it's like you kind of want to get people to laugh at something because they almost have to because it's true. Yeah. But they didn't ever think about it that way. Right. Now, uh, and that's that's yeah. more difficult to do than what people normally describe as shock value humor or edgy humor, which is, right. you know, harkens back to Andrew Dice Clay in the 80s being like, so I got my tongue in this chick's ass, right? And then that would get a yeah. huge laugh from the audience because it was so shocking. But there's also no level of like, oh, what am I thinking about here while Andrew says that? <laughs> Yeah, there's no switcheroo. There's no intellectual there's no component pulling, pulling the rug out of them. Yeah, yeah. It literally is shock value, and I don't have a problem right. with that either. I feel like that's a viable route as long as the audience is laughing. They're the ones that get to decide and if it's as funny. long as they like it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, um, and so you moved here in 2004, and uh, you started crushing it. Like instantly. Oh, I actually, I, um, I didn't move to LA till late 2005. I started doing well in 2004 oh, okay. in San Francisco. And then in 2005, I got invited to the Boston International Comedy Festival. And as part of that right. festival, there was a competition, the $10,000 stand-up comedy contest. And uh, I, yeah. I went out, I stayed on a friend's floor in Boston and uh, I won the whole competition. And after I won the whole yeah, thing, I remember that. That was great. My phone started ringing, and within a few weeks, I was back in San Francisco, and HBO was having auditions at the Punchline. And uh, um, after I did that, my phone started ringing with like managers and agents, 
saying, who are you? And I was expecting that. And because I was expecting that, I said, well, why don't I mail you information? And I would mail them a press packet with articles and a resume and a DVD of 20 minutes of material. And that, that's what separated me from a lot of the other people that won that big comedy competition, which is when managers and agents would call them and say, hey, can you send us something? They'd be like, yeah, I'll get right on that. And then they wouldn't send anything. I'd sent out yeah, all sorts of packets. They didn't have it. Yeah. I was like, yeah. you want to know about me? Here's everything you need to know. Call me. And yeah. they loved that. I think that's what helped. Yeah, that, that helped me get work uh, a lot in the beginning, too. I didn't win any big uh, competitions, but I did have a lot of press stuff. I made sure to tape everything. And uh, I was always good with, um, you know, making CDs and DVDs yeah. and sending things out. Yeah, that's it's, huge. It's been something that's been on my mind a lot because uh, the first time I was ever ever had the the chance that I might be able to audition for television um, which when you're in San Francisco the only connection you have to anything on a national level is the hope that somebody from TV will come and sit in the club and say you're great that's your only bridge to get out of that local scene and the first time I thought that was gonna happen for me um, I remember the booker at the punchline pulled me into the green room and said hey Ryan um, I just want you to know a lot of your friends are going to be auditioning tonight and you're not. And I want you to know why. It's not because I don't think you're funny and it's not because I don't think you have earned it. Uh, the TV people called me and they said, hey, listen, we've already seen too many white guys. So we, we saw white guys right. in Dallas. We saw white guys in Denver. We saw white guys in Chicago. We don't want any more white guys. And I remember being 19 years old and smiling and going, okay, I just have a little question. What if I'm funnier than some of the white guys they saw in Dallas <laughs> or Chicago or Denver? And I remember the response was this. I will remember it forever. It was. <laughs> and at that point, at 19, I was like, OK, so I'm competing against a lot of other white guys who I'll never know. How do I compete at that level and and win? And the answer was, well, I need to make sure that I have materials, which is what you're talking about. You have those DVDs, you have that, those recordings, you have stuff to show people. And, right. you know, without learning that lesson so early on, that this is a competitive environment, I, I would not have done well. And I, I think about a lot of comics now in Los Angeles who never learned that lesson. I saw a comic uh, probably eight months ago and she's been doing comedy for 20 years. And she was on stage. I watched her do a half hour. And she was great. And afterwards, she was like, yeah, I just don't know why I'm not getting ahead. I was like, yeah, that's, that's odd. And I went home. I looked her up on YouTube. No clips. I looked her up on Spotify. Nothing to yeah. listen to. I look up her website. It's like a bio. And then that's it. And it was like, you've been doing it for 20 years. You don't have any materials to show. How can I, how can yeah. I tell somebody in the industry that you're funny if, if I can't back that up with something? Right. Yeah, because now it, it all is about YouTube. It's not about sending a CD or a DVD. It's like you got to have it up online. But people then they want to see not just if you're funny, but like, do you have any hits? Right. You know, yeah, yeah, how's yeah. your channel doing? Do you have any uh, subscribers? Are you and, already popular uh, or do we have to help you? Because we don't want right. to help you. <laughs> <laughs> right. They don't want to help you get popular. No, <laughs> no. Yeah, that's what I was always looking for. Someone that's, uh, you know, looking to develop a comic. They're like, no, we don't want to develop you. We want you to develop yourself. Right. And uh, we'll, we'll come in and uh, make money off you at the end. Right. And, and that's what I'm trying to do uh, with this YouTube show. Sure. <laughs> and that's what's really amazing is a lot of the people who work in that industry of saying, oh, we just grab talent and then squeeze them for money and then let them go. Uh, they're losing their jobs especially since coronavirus <laughs> swept the planet and the industry is shifting hard and so many people are working from home. All of the talent is going, well, I don't need you. I don't need you to do a contract for me. I could just go on YouTube and collect money from ad sales. What do I need you for? Yeah. 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 This, uh, this virus man and, and the comedy scene, it's, uh, it's crazy. I, I wonder how long it's going to take. I guess we just need 
we need either a, a treatment that's going to make it just as dangerous as the flu or or some sort of vaccine that mm-hmm. also sort of puts it on par with the flu and then we can get back. But uh, man, stand-up comedy is one of those industries that's taking a huge hit. Yeah, people sit in a room really shoulder to shoulder and breathe heavy. <laughs> this is not, <laughs> this is not good for us. <laughs> and I yeah. honestly, even if there is a treatment, that's not going to eliminate the fear that people have of getting sick. And people are not going to jam themselves into rooms until that fear goes away which means the competition in the world of stand-up just, you know, just increased beyond what it could already handle. And uh, it's, yeah, we're, we're going to start seeing a lot of comics getting out of the business. So uh, somebody's asking here, uh, who's, who's the guest? So uh, do you have that mug? <laughs> no, yeah. I don't. Do you want uh, I've, I've oh, to? I've got a different mug. Uh, oh, he used to have a mug with his name on it. Um, yeah. So can uh, so this everybody that's just tuning in, this is uh, Ryan Stout. And could you can you show your uh, thing? Oh, the, the website. Oh, oh. Of course that that computer turned off. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah. So let's. Does that does that look correct? That does. That looks great. So uh, those are my albums. Ryan Go buy those. Is, those are all four of the albums. Wow, you did a great job making the artwork all look uh, like it goes together. Yeah. Well, three this, albums, uh, and then then that's just true. something to even out. It's not. It's not great. It's not great work. It's garbage. But. I'm very. I'm very <laughs> lucky to have you uh, helping me on this uh, on this show, Near the Curve. Yeah. You're very. Uh, you're very nice to be doing this. This is. Uh, <laughs> you are out of most people's league. Uh-huh. I am very lucky to know you <laughs> Thanks, <man>. personally. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, it's it's funny because I I know that you're asking me you're asking a lot of me and simultaneously you're not asking very much of me. Like in my head I've compartmentalized it into well, I'm going to hop on a call with Emmett on Wednesday night and we'll talk for an hour or two and we'll Mm -hmm. find some jokes. And then if he's happy, great. If not, we'll just keep tweaking until he, he is happy. And that's all I have to do once a week for you anyway. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I, I try to make it as as easy as uh, possible by having, you know, a a good framework of, you know, existing jokes and things I want to talk about and, and things to go over. So we're not just, you know, out of the blue, uh, coming up with stuff. Um, and that's, that seemed to have worked, but, uh, yeah, I mean, the stuff that we've been able to come up with together based off of that is always like, you know, 10 X what, uh, what I would have, you know, been doing alone. Sure. Um, and I, yeah. I think about that in terms of how kind of the Hollywood industry treats comedians that always annoyed me, which is if they're going to do a show about cars, they always say, well, which comedians have bits about cars? Which comedians are gearheads? Get them in here and then let them talk about cars. But then when a comedian gets in front of the camera and starts talking about their passion, it's not funny. They don't have jokes prepared. They're just talking about what they love. And the industry doesn't learn, oh, we should, if we want funny, we should just hire people who know how to write jokes and then say, hey, write us 25 jokes about cars. But the industry never learns. So I've been on shows talking about music where I'm not a music expert, but I wrote jokes about music. I've been on pop culture shows where I'm not a pop culture wizard, but I know how to read an article about Justin Bieber and come up with three jokes. (laughs) Um, And so when you came along and said, I want to do a tech show, I just thought, all right, well, I I don't know anything about technology, but I can write jokes. (laughs) Well, that's what most people, uh, that's what most people said that, that I asked them to, uh, to help me out is they were like, well, I don't know anything about that. And, uh, and I, I, my answer was the same. I kept trying to say, well, sometimes it would be good for you to just be like, oh, I don't get that. Like, and cause I need to know that people are not going to understand this uh, technology that I'm talking about. Cause I am trying to make it accessible to uh, the lay person, the person that, you know, doesn't go read all the articles and watch all the documentaries and read the same books as Elon Musk. Uh, you know, like 
um, if that person's not getting it and not laughing, mm -hmm. then I'm not, I'm not doing my job. Yeah. So I, I actually really want people to help me write that are not, uh, you know, tech people. So that, that they're the perfect audience. Sure. And there have been plenty of times where we've yeah. been on a call and I went, yeah, man, I'm not, I'm not getting it. I'm not up on that at all. And then when you tell me what you're trying to communicate, I go, oh, well, that's easy. Let's just make that line funny. I don't even need to know everything about right. quantum mechanics. We could just work on that one line. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, I guess my point is there's a lot of co compartmentalizing in my head of like, well, I just give Emmett a couple of hours and we focus that down into individual lines and thoughts and ideas. So it feels very easy to me rather than, you know, when you're a comic, you're in charge of your entire career from what your website looks like to what you're wearing on stage to every word that comes out of your mouth to booking the gigs. You're in charge of this world of stuff. Whereas, you know, working with you on something like this, I go, I'm just, I'm just in charge of this little sliver. I can handle that. Yeah, exactly. I know. I'm, uh, and so I'm super grateful for your help. And I don't, I can't imagine someone who's going to be better because you've just like knocked it out of the park. But I am trying to get more people, mm -hmm. uh, if only to, uh, you know, to make it easy if somebody's not available or. If, you know, whatever they're busy. Um, and so I think through us working together, I figured out, yeah, if I just have enough for people to work with, they only really have to, you know, chime in for an hour. I, I think you do, you do a little extra, you go and you read the script, uh, beforehand. And, uh, sometimes you write things, um, yeah. before we even talk. Yeah. I, I do. Um, I do feel but, a responsibility that like when I, on, on a moral level, if I say I'm going to help, I actually have to help. <laughs> so I try to I try to step up as a person and say, look, if you're going to give him the two hours, give him the two hours. Don't don't fake it. <laughs> and that's the other issue is yeah. in the entertainment industry. A lot of people are just showing up to collect their paycheck and they don't really show up to create something. It's a very uh, the, that's perfect for this one because there is no paycheck. Right. So right. 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 So that you know, was that would be a there's deterrent. not a distraction for you. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's, it's very funny since, what did you study in college? Speech comm. Speech comm. Speech communications. Okay. So I studied creative writing. Yeah. And so you would sit in these classes that would talk about creating stuff all day long. Every, every lesson was about how do you, you know, work on your plot? How do you work on character development? How do you work on, if you're working on poetry, how do you condense your words? Um, and it was all about you as a human creating something on the page. But then you get into the world of business and the world of business says, hey, don't create anything until you have a check. No, no, no. Go into this office yeah. and convince somebody that they should pay you for the thing you're about to create. And that's how Hollywood has started working from, you know, yeah. the top all the way down. You've got you've got comedians who have never been on stage who literally want a development deal before they get on stage <laughs> you go guys it's at some right. point you have to make something and uh uh yeah. that's that's kind of where i always came from so when you came to me and said hey i actually want to make something i went oh good i understand that i understand him making things yeah and we're trying to um i'm i'm going to be helping you uh with with whatever it is you got coming down the pike we we worked on that one thing um that, that intro to the web series that, that you were planning. Yeah. But I think you've got some different, uh, some different things you're working on now. No, I'm still trying to really drag that web series out and figure out, uh, how to articulate some of the deeper ideas that I want to discuss. And it's, it's going to be a web series kind of about stand up comedy. It's, it's funny. I was sitting, uh, talking to a therapist probably a couple of years ago. And at one point I told the therapist, you know how, how people, um, they try to do something in life and then they, they kind of fall on their face and then they get back up and they want to teach other people, oh, here's where I went wrong. And the therapist went, I'm sorry, what was that? I said, you know, that, that like deep down need to like help other people so they don't make the same mistakes that you made. And he went, oh no, Ryan, you've, you've invented that in your head. People do not feel that way. You feel that way. You want to help people so they don't make the same mistakes you did. Most people go, screw you. I had to learn the hard way. You learn the hard way. And I went, oh, that's very interesting. I didn't know that I had like a deep down need to share that stuff. So I wanted to create a web series saying, look, 
I was a guy that started watching stand-up comedy when I was eight years old. And then I got curious about it, started doing it, had a career doing it. And here's what went wrong during the career. What, how can I help you, eight-year-old kid who wants to be a yeah. stand-up comic, learn the lessons quicker so that you don't have to fall on your face like I did? Right. Yeah. Well, uh, man, I don't know many people. Yeah, I think your therapist is right. Uh, I mean, I, I don't necessarily try to create things to um, educate. help people figure out where I went wrong. Yeah. yeah. But I do want to educate yeah. uh, and entertain. Yeah. 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 No, different, different motivation. But that's, that does sound like a, that sounds like a series that I, I could have definitely used. Right. Uh, right. <laughs> I think most comics and actually, uh, you know, yeah, need it before they even get started. Yeah. Well, um, and, and I think audiences are going to uh, kind of need what, what you <laughs> have to say to them as well. That's ultimately what was very frustrating for me as a comic, which was I thought everybody was watching stand-up comedy the way I was as a kid. I thought everybody was, you know, watching HBO, watching Letterman, getting all this information before they ever got to go sit in a comedy club. And it turns out now plenty of people sat there and just went, all right, we're at the comedy club now. Make me laugh. I don't know anything about this, but I know it's your job, so you do it. Go. <laughs> right. And there's no responsibility amongst the audience, but they somehow believe that it is their responsibility when they walk into a art gallery to say, oh, I should know something about painting before I judge the paintings. <laughs> they like naturally right. believe it's, that. It's, yeah, it's somehow super obvious in an art gallery that uh, everything is uh, just up to your own... Uh, interpretation of it and it's very personal but somehow yeah. in a in a comedy club it's not personal it's it's your fault comedian yeah um yeah yeah so yeah that, trying, that is a weird trying thing. to articulate that to an audience that believes that they are always right the audience believes that we're always right and you go nah you know what not always you always win but you're not yeah. always right <laughs> uh <laughs> And I think the best example that you know all too well is you get on stage on a Monday and you tell a joke and it kills. And then the joke kills on Tuesday and on Wednesday. And then it kills again on Thursday. And then late show Friday, the audience goes, nah, it's not funny. And you go, really? Because you're going to have to go argue with all those other crowds if you're going to say it's not funny. Yeah. You don't have to argue with me, but you have to go argue with them. Right. Uh, but I, I did want to say about Nia the Curve, um, yeah. An another reason that I was interested in doing it goes back to something from, do you know Simon Sinek? Uh, he's an author. He, he had a hit book called uh, Start With Why. And it was about the greatest businesses in America had a really strong ethos about why they were doing what they're doing. And so our very first meeting about Nia the Curve, you were really clear about, look, there's this technological tidal wave approaching. We're not ready and we don't yeah. even believe the tidal wave is going to hit us. And so this is a right. warning series about how tech is going to change. And I went, right. all right, well, he's not going to flake out on that idea. He really believes that. <laughs> so um, if, I, if I put my time and effort into helping him with two, three, four, five, six episodes, it's not like he's going to call me one day and go, yeah, I've changed my mind. It's not that big of a deal. Yeah. Tech's not really that big of a yeah. problem. <laughs> you were going to stick with it. <laughs> right. And, and you know what? Tech slowed down. Uh, it's going backwards now. So no idea. We're, we're good. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I was hooked by your why. And that's that motivating factor that pushes you to do this. You know, I think it pushes myself and anybody else who wants to help write or just even watch your channel. Yeah, I know. I think uh, most people still, though, just choose not to think about it. Uh, it's one of those things that's pretty easy for people to choose not to think about. When they think about tech, they think about their phone. And yeah, they think about how social media is kind of, um, you know, shifting society a little bit. And um, these are just the immediate things mm -hmm. that are sort of tangentially affecting their, their lives. They don't think about the exponential growth 
that is, uh, you know, about to crash on us like a tidal wave that is going to be like, oh, like, because it's going to be like one, one day computers aren't awake and like the next day nobody can get a job because the computers are doing everything. It's going to, yeah. it's going to feel like it happened like that to everybody because nobody's paying attention to it. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. And, um, and you're, you are very passionate about that idea and it's an idea that makes sense. It's not like people that are passionate about, you know, the lizard people, man, lizard people are controlling everything we do. Those right. people are passionate, but they, right, the Anunnaki. they're, they're also, they can't quite back up anything that they're saying. No. Yeah. No, I know I have, uh, people close to me in my life that are anti-vaxxers and, um, wow. I didn't know that conspiracy theorists. Huh. Uh, I know one guy who thinks, um, who thinks cryptocurrency what is a, how did he put it? Uh, an alien technology from a sister civilization in another dimension sent back in time to save us from, uh, the apocalypse or something. Wow. That's what do you think? That's his like de definition of, yeah. um, a Bitcoin. And it's hard to get blockchain. passionate, passionate about yeah. that idea without like a serious dose of crystal meth. Right. I mean, yeah, you know, maybe, <laughs> maybe it's true, but, uh, you know, yeah, that is, that is a lot of large rabbit holes fueled by paranoia. Yeah I, yeah, I just so whereas the things the the crazy things that I'm talking about are like, you know, just projecting out what technology we have already and the growth of technology that's already happened and saying, well, this is possible and this is possible and not only possible, but very likely and likely and likely and likely. And we're seeing a lot of these things happen mm -hmm. uh, anyway, like Elon Musk's Neuralink and, you know, we're going to Mars and uh, exponential growth of computing. Um so I think I, it's fascinating I, right now, all of the social unrest that's happening is strictly because a whole bunch of people were able to get a computer in their pocket and talk to each other via that computer and just give their opinion freely. And that caused so much collide amongst people. So much trouble. And if, yeah. if people don't think tribalism grew directly out of the 2007 iPhone, um, you're, you're out of your mind. Yes. The, you know, the social right. component to how technology affects our lives is huge. And uh, the idea that... So do you think it made it grow or do you think it unearthed what was already there? Um, I think there is a... In, in certain situations, people probably have a, a deep down... Uh, self-protective instinct to go, I should blend in with the group so that I'm not a target. Um, but it only happens, yeah. it only happens, you know, when you're at a bar and then a bar fight breaks out and you go, Oh, I should go with these people to prove that I'm not part of that so that nobody hits me. Yeah, or you're in prison yeah. or something. I guess yeah. I'm in prison and I only have so many choices and everyone in here is telling me what my choices are. So I'll just pick. Yeah. Uh, I think everybody has yeah. a level of instinct for tribalism, but it only came out in very select situations. But when it was put in front of your face on a global level every single day, saying you need to choose, and if you choose wrong, the mob is going to gang up on you and take your job away and threaten yeah. your family and everything like that. You know, we, we took tribalism to a brand new level, and it was a lot of fear-based interactions. And who's not going to be afraid of the mob of zombies? who can attack you with impunity yeah. over the internet. It's going to be, everybody's yeah. afraid. I'm afraid. Why wouldn't you be? Right. We need another common enemy, uh, like an alien uh, invasion. Yeah. You know, they always say that would galvanize humanity in one common, you know, goal. But I think the aliens that we're really going to see are, uh, are the rise of robots and artificial intelligences mm. and, um, yeah, that's going to be just as alien and weird. I mean, we're already seeing, um, 
you know, how strange people think of uh, these robots, you know, all the Black Mirror stuff. Yeah. Uh, well, you're going to have Blade like Runner situations. The at the beginning. You're going to yeah. you're going to be trying to figure out, are you a robot or are you real? <laughs> right. Well, I'm looking forward to that. Yeah. And I'm actually I'm looking forward to the point. See, I'm an optimist. I'm hoping that they get those robots so great to the point where I can kind of like shift my consciousness over or like, you know, replace an arm and a leg and, a, you know, eventually up through into the neurons yeah. and, uh, you know, eventually I'm kind of indestructible, you know, cyborg guy. Sure. Uh, and then I'll just go, you know, kick it in space in my, in my spaceship. You know, I mean, that's the, the downside that's is why I'm making the show. The ultimate, your, ultimate reason is I'm just trying to be a space yeah, pirate. Yeah, and and unfortunately, your enemies will also be space pirates. So it's kind of a tough, <laughs> um, you know, uh, as the technology increases, everybody increases. I think there's a level of uh, lack of trust that um, has been kind of eating away at society. And unfortunately, technology has helped us stop trusting each other because now... Now we have no reason to trust the news. We have no reason to trust politicians, doctors. We have no reason to trust insurance companies. It's across the board. We don't, we don't trust anybody. And the thing that we came up with to enhance trust was the idea of religion. Religion really helped us across the board go, hey, I don't know you, but you're wearing that symbol around your neck. And I believe in that symbol too. So we're cool. And that's not, yeah. there's no technology there. There's no science behind that. There's no logic behind that. It's just faith. And I think as faith has been eroded, we stopped trusting each other. And uh, yeah, um, technology helped us not maybe, trust each other. Maybe the singularity, the idea of the singularity uh, needs its own uh, like universal symbol. So that if you believe in the singularity, you can wear a little thing around your neck and people are like, oh, he, he, this person likes uh, technology. And they, you know, think of the idea that this is going to, you know, have a exponential boom and who knows what's going to happen at the other side of that thing. Yeah. And uh, it sounds like good merch yeah, for your maybe, web store. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, man. You need to sell pens. So, uh, <laughs> In the comments, please uh, throw some ideas out for uh, <laughs> for symbols for the singularity. Yeah, um, yeah, we need a pendant. We need to get some new merch. And by the way, this is this is exactly what L. Ron Hubbard was thinking. <laughs> he was like, "Yeah, we got to create a, a religion, everybody. <laughs> That's the only way. <laughs> it's the only way to get ahead. That's what you really want." I know, man. If I could just make this uh, near the curve turn it from a comedy show into a religion, you'll, I would have you'll be fine. so much money. Yeah. Yeah. I'll be really fine. Uh -huh. Yeah. <laughs> it's it's hard to, to to think about how all of these ideas of religion and social unrest and trust, they all tie in with technology in some way. And having all of those threads on top of each other and trying to pull one out at a time is so difficult. It's a real it's a monkey knot. Yeah. Yeah. There's too much. There's so many different technologies uh, also converging at the same time to create this this whole thing. Yeah. It's going to be uh, crazy times. I think. Uh, I don't know. What, what do you think? Uh, where do you think we're going to be in like uh, 30 years? 30. Uh, so, you know, that's that's not even my forte. I've I listened to you on that. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I know, but I always like to get people's uh, people's opinions, you know? I think it's hard to guess just because I remember what we were doing in 2002. And we had little Nokia cell phones in our pockets with black and white screens. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, we would go home and log on to our email to see if maybe somebody emailed us. We would have never guessed yeah. that in less than 20 years we would just be sitting in a pandemic having a call with all this fancy equipment and that call would be broadcast yeah. to people like we're like we're friggin' television entrepreneurs. <laughs> like this idea right. would have cost so many millions of dollars when we started doing stand -up. Right, we'd have to have a huge studio behind us yeah. to do this. Yeah, I assume yeah. in 20 years, every single one of us is gonna have some sort of hospital wing of our own home 
where we can go and <laughs> do surgery on ourselves and get diagnosed with things. That's, right. That, I mean, it, or it wouldn't even have to be a wing. It could just be, um, you know, your toilet and like a, maybe a laptop sized um, or like and a 3D printer in your in your bathroom. Yeah. So it just sort of like reads your what you need and prints you out a drug or uh -huh. uh, something like that. Uh huh. Yeah. Prints you out a drug. And it, uh, or prints you out a prints you out a custom virus that's uh, got a CRISPR genetic code in there that goes and actually just changes your genome so that you can just be better. Yeah. So your your system fights the virus, right? Or fights whatever's wrong with you. Right. Ah, uh, you. I'm hope. I'm thinking in 30 years we'll have that. I don't know about 20 years. Ah, uh, you know. But if I've yeah. learned anything, technology comes quicker than we expect. So I'm going to guess three exactly. years. Exactly. Three years. Three years. It is. It is well, weird you know, to think of, about like uh, these these new computers that are in diagnostics that have a better better rate at like diagnosing cancer than actual human doctors. It's fascinating, right? And how easy it is. Shades of gray. How easy it is to ship one see. of those fancy machines to another state or another country, and it's wild to think that actual doctors that do diagnostics are gonna be out of work. Meanwhile, the nurse who holds your hand and wraps your arm up and sticks the needle in there and draws the blood, like that human interaction, like their jobs are secure mm -hmm. for now. Because we like that. We like having right. a person to talk to and hold us and tell us that we're a good patient. Yeah, you don't really want a robotic arm that's like, zzz, zzz, yeah. and then just goes right into your vein and uh, you know, starts sucking out the blood. You're like, oh, okay. Yeah, uh, I'm sure this machine's fine. <laughs> yeah, it'll, it'll hit right on the bullseye. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Love it. Yeah, you want that nice nurse tapping your, tapping your vein. Yeah. A and and do you want to be able to say, all right, machine, it's still bleeding. What do I do? Uh, hello, right. hello. Don't tell me I'll be fine. It's not fine. Yeah. See, this is the kind of news I wish there was more of. This is honestly why I made the show because uh, you know you you turn on YouTube and I've I've been a cord cutter for a long time and uh, it it just gives you all the political news and stuff about, I don't know, just whatever's kind of depressing. And the news about technology, I think it can be scary to a lot of people, but it also can be very, uh, very positive. It's inspiring. Yeah. Fun. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and by the way, I think one of the elements that kind of uh, brought us together on this particular project was that as the competitive element of stand-up comedy increased and our age increased and we started looking out at a whole new generation of comics we both started going all right what do we need to do to compete and broadcasting things over the internet seemed like the answer so you started looking up right. technology on youtube as far as camera and mics and you know uh building your own computer around the same time i did and I didn't have yeah. anybody to talk to about that stuff. So the very idea that you were doing it simultaneously while I was doing it, it was like, oh, well, yeah. we'll we can talk about that stuff all day. And then we can talk about bigger technology. Yeah. Uh, and let's, let's face it, the fact that we're both in Los Angeles and you live up the street from me, proximity, right. proximity yeah. is key. <laughs> It's huge. If, it's huge. We don't have those self-driving cars yet. So uh, if I lived in Chicago, like, you and I would not no. be doing this. No, yeah. not at all. Yeah. Although I was worried that it was going to uh, put a big damper on things because I used to go over to your house and we used to do this in person oh, yeah. uh, and write together for an hour or two. And now I was like, oh, man, am I going to get is it going to be as productive? Is he going to do it? Mm. And um but I feel like uh, we've even done a few video chats um, for it, and it's been extremely productive. Um, we're on the Google Doc at the same time, and uh, it's, I don't think I've noticed any like, you know, fewer amount of jokes or anything. It's been great. No, we both we both pivoted pretty well, and I think that goes back to what I was yeah. talking about earlier, which is the reason for doing the show didn't change. The your passionate reasons for why this channel needs to be made remained steadfast despite what's happening in the world. So we just shifted to 
<laughs> you know, give service to that idea. Got to have a strong right. reason why. Yeah. If anybody does anything out That's there. Right. Um, so I want to tell everybody that uh, I've got a new video. It's a behind the scenes of uh, the making of the last uh, Knee of the Curve. It was about WWDC. Uh, but I go through the entire uh, process of making the show. And I actually uh, talked with you and Jeremy, the other uh, writer on the show. Um, and I have those videos, some funny moments from those video chats uh, in the video. I couldn't get it uh, done by today. So I'm glad we actually did this today. But I yeah. uh, should have it edited uh, by tonight and posted up uh, tomorrow morning. So actually, if uh, there's a bunch of stuff that I talk about that's a specific jokes to the WWDC uh, episode. So if you guys haven't seen that, uh, check that out and then you'll kind of get the jokes uh, when you see the behind the scenes. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. You, you'll see uh, weaker versions of those same jokes. <laughs> you'll, <laughs> you'll hear the, us uh, sit around stall. going, oh, I don't know. I don't know how yeah. to make that funny. Right. Yeah. I noticed, yeah, we're talking about it. And I, I was like, oh, I have to put in there what we're talking about, or they're not going to understand what this punchline is. Uh, yeah. So I kind of had that text uh, at the bottom, like this is on um, Apple Silicon taking two years to uh, transition. And then it's us uh, kind of Come, you basically coming up with that divorce uh, divorce papers joke, which is, I think, a lot of people's oh, yeah. favorite joke on that episode. Yeah, that's oh, Chanty's fun. favorite joke. Yeah, 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 yeah. And and by the way, people might not realize that we're on the call, and I'm like, all right, Emmett, I didn't even watch this thing. I didn't watch Apple's announcements. Right. I didn't tune in for whatever they were doing. So you tell right. me what happened. You tell me what you want to say about it, and then we'll we'll tinker from there. And that works out so perfect for me, too, because a lot of times – just saying stuff to you and making someone have to understand it rather than just writing it on a page. It makes yeah. me articulate uh, so much better uh, than. Right. Yeah. So I, I get help from you just by having you there to talk to. Uh, well, thanks. Yeah. yeah. And I, I know that uh, our, our peers, comics, like to talk and they are not always the best listeners. So uh, yeah. I consider that a compliment that you're like, I'll talk to Ryan because he'll listen and respond. <laughs> <laughs> yes. No, you're uh, you're great. And actually, you know what? I feel um, I'm I'm getting a bunch of noises in my headphones, like they're gonna uh, stop. Uh, so we're actually at an hour, and this is kind of a a good place to stop anyway. Because um, I I don't. This is our first. This is the first podcast. I, I'm not sure if I'm technically proficient enough to like find the right place yeah. to <laughs> plug in extra headphones. So, but sure. uh, and if people will please uh, buy my albums, yeah, go buy <laughs> Ryan's albums. He's got three damn yep. albums. They're amazing. I mean, look me up on uh, Spotify or whatever. That's right. So, yeah. Um, yeah. Well, thanks and, for having and, me. Buddy. Actually, go we'll do check this again. Uh, go check Ryan's YouTube channel out as well. He's got a bunch of clips yeah. up there. Um, ton of clips. And... <laughs> Ton what of clips. That? Oh, ton no, of clips. Nothing new. Yeah. Nothing new. But I'll get some more up there soon enough. Cool. All right. Well, awesome, uh, buddy. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks for doing this. This was great. Thank you. I'll talk to you again real soon. All right. Sounds good. <laughs> Later. Cheers, buddy.